Discord, or you can email me, but I tell you, I will pay a lot more attention if you use one of those channels because I'm overwhelmed with emails. But if you do it in Slack or Discord, I'm more likely to write you back quickly. So, all right. Thank you. I will mute myself. Thanks, Shaley. Yep. All right. <laughs> Do people need a quick break? Or should I just go for it? People can take breaks as they need to. You know what? Um, I do have a quick poll. We could just do like one or two minutes uh, and I can play music if that's what you wanted to do. Um, or we could just roll on. And I want to interject that I encourage people to take breaks when you need to, because we're recording this and we'll have the cloud sessions available for all of us here. Um, and know you can use a little microphone on, and have like your phone in your back pocket with like your little headphone in if you need to do something. That's a nice way to listen and still take your time. Okay. All right. Take we'll your poll, David. Thanks, Shaylee. Yeah, go. Okay. Hey, everybody. My name is Abby. Um, I am here on Kalapuya Homelands uh, in the place of Eugene, Oregon and specifically at a place called Maitreya Eco Village. Um, a long time ago, before there were seven dams put up around the city of Eugene, this would have been a big old wetland. Um, so it's a, a unique time in history to be uh, gardening in a wetland. And um, I have some things to say about social permaculture and the invisible structures that work in an eco village. Um, there's lot, a lot in the way of plants and gardening happening around us, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but mostly I'm going to talk about um, the things behind the scenes and what really the social elements that make the gardens happen, that make the spaces happen, um, and some factors that we need to think about with the changing future, changing climate, changing social environment um, that I think are really important and that permaculture can bring a lot of value to. Um, so that's my pitch. and. To start off um, on the Eco Village, I wanted to introduce Rob Bullman, who uh, started this place, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the history of Maitreya. <laughs> there I am. There. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, well, my name is Rob, and uh, almost 30 years ago, it'll be 30 uh, years in May. Uh, I I my mother and I bought this property in West Eugene. At the time, it was just meant to be a, a, a real estate investment. Uh, and I, I knew that my construction skills would come in handy on these fixer upper houses. But then soon after moving here, I discovered this field called green building and I kind of clombed onto it and I became a green build. It, it became a, a form of activism for me. I became a, a major green building person in Eugene. And because I had this property with a lot of buildable space, I, I kept building these interesting buildings. And every time I would build an interesting building, these interesting people would come and move into the building. And, and the place just tore to, took on a life of its own. And now there's about 30, 35 people living here that, that's expanded to other adjoining uh, properties and I, I don't own. Uh, and, and, uh, and uh, we have quite an interesting uh, well, permaculture demonstration site and a uh, green building, a natural building demonstration site. We've done various earthen things, earthen floors, earthen plasters, cob, straw bale, uh, slip chip, straw, straw, uh, straw clay kind of stuff. And uh, uh, I, I just view the idea of an eco village with what I understand now of civilization's trajectory as being kind of like a lifeboat. Uh, we're going to put together all these examples of how to do things better. And then when this dominant paradigm begins to really crumble, uh, then people are going to look to us and say, oh, let's do what they're doing because they got something going on there. So, so that's basically the story. Uh, you're interested in the, how the name came to be? Yeah, tell us about the name Maitreya. Well, in, uh, 2000, I had just finished building a, a, or 2002 actually, I had just finished building a, a three unit building here and a 
bunch of people moved into it, uh, several of whom were pretty seriously into meditation. And uh, in the, the, one of them selected the name Ma Maitreya, and we all we couldn't agree on anything else, so we chose Maitreya Eco Village. Maitreya is supposed to be a in, in Buddhist tradition, Maitreya is a new incarnation of the Buddha who's supposed to come back as a loving, nurturing community as opposed to uh, an individual. So that's how the name sort of works and makes sense here. And um, I still do my meditation practice. I recently finished building a meditation sanctuary. And so I really want for this to be a contemplative place amid all the chaos and the wild whooping up parties and stuff like that. <laughs> There's a little bit of everything here. So, anything else? I don't think so. I think I can take it from there. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, bye bye, everyone. <laughs> so, Rob is going to our uh, monthly community meeting right now, which most people are in attendance of. And I. Thank uh, you, Rob. <laughs> that's Julie Wolf. Julie Wolf. Yeah. Okay, okay. bye bye. <laughs> Yeah, tonight, monthly community meeting, most people are there. There was just an interview for a new um, roommate. The way we work is kind of in a household system. This is Hannah, she's a community member. <laughs> um, and yeah, the way we work is kind of in a household basis where the primary unit of togetherness is the household, the few people that share um, a kitchen and a bathroom and living space. And uh, the community is kind of this emergent thing that evolves and ebbs and flows quite a bit depending on who's here at the time. And that's what I love about this place and um, similar places I've been is when you show up to a place and the place responds to you and you can give your energy to it and it, and it shifts based on that. But there's this emergent identity that happens um, in, a, in a place like this that I think is really beautiful and really where the world needs to go that in a way that's less individualistic and more based on the commons. So before it gets too dark, I wanna just show you a little bit from my uh, internet station here. I'm not very mobile right now, so I won't be walking around much, but um, you can see from over my shoulder, kind of the layout of our eco village. We are surrounded on two sides by city streets right in the urban center. Uh, on the edge of the industrial zone. So there's factories um, off to the west, there's downtown to the east, not very far away. And um, on the inside, the, the what would be conventionally the back doors of the city houses, kind of the same old houses you'd see anywhere, uh, the back doors we use as front doors. A long time ago, the fences were taken down as um, Rob bought up neighboring properties and was cultivating the community vibe here. Um, and now we have this big central garden that's really just a combination of a few backyards in a city that over time people have planted gardens, uh, tended to perennials, um, built brick, beautiful brick uh, pathways with a fire pit in the center. All those buckets back there because this was organized last minute, I did absolutely no tidying. So this is a complete candid shot of our community right now. The buckets there, we filled with water in preparation for potential embers falling from the recent fires. Um, Eugene wasn't in any danger. There weren't any houses that burnt down, but um, we took it upon ourselves to be prepared just in case. <laughs> um, yeah, over there you can see, I think, let's see. The light colored building, let's see if I can point to it up there, is the most recently built building that's a meditation sanctuary. Uh, Rob did a beautiful job using uh, locally produced lumber and a lot of natural plasters to create a space designated just for any kind of meditative activity. I like to do yoga there in the mornings with my neighbor. Um, see if I can give you a shot of the house that I live in, which is a triplex. Um, some cedar shingles, passion flower vine, several neighbors, lots of fruit trees around and perennials. Um, so that's a little bit, what else do we have in the way of community buildings? Hannah, you wanna introduce any more elements to the physical space? Mm, like the straw bale building? 
Oh yeah. Um, um, well, yeah, there's like a community room. So um, I run, personally, I run like this street library. It's like a bike cart um, with a library on it. And I just take it out to a, a local market and hang out. And um, there's space in there that I could store like a lot of books. And so it kind of also functions as like a place where people can maybe, well, I mean like the books were intended for anyone to use them. So it's community oriented, but um, it's kind of open in that way. Uh, wait, um, nice. So it's cool to have like, um, it's really nice to have like these spaces that like, like our houses themselves aren't that big, they're pretty small. So it's nice to have like these different rooms that like kind of serve this one function, but like are shared by everyone. There's also like um, this shared guest house. Um, and so like if anyone here has a guest that they'd like to have over, they can like reserve this room and it has a bed and we clean sheets, whatever. And um, yeah, I, I love that. I love that people can be invited in that way. And it's just like this shared feature. Nice. And one thing I got really curious about moving back here, this is, I've been here on and off for eight years. This is the first place that I landed when I moved from Minnesota to Oregon. And as I was looking for a place to be long-term um, and talking to some of my friends about where I was gonna land and where I was gonna be, I was looking to move from the place I was previously a few years ago um, on a land trust. I was like, where can I find a permanent home? And one of my indigenous elder friends told me, don't talk about land ownership, Abby. Talk about where, what is the land that owns you? And that was such a helpful reframing on how I thought about interacting with land. And for, through a series of events that I still don't really understand or can explain, I ended up back here. And so this right now to me is the land that owns me. and when I'm here and I see all these spaces that are communally held, I, call, I have so many questions about how does this place work? How do we actually run this place together? Who is, who is doing that work and why are they doing it? What is motivating us to continue doing this? What isn't happening and how can it happen? And this is where social permaculture, I think really comes into play and becomes really important. Um, what we have here is this, this skeleton of these, these buildings that don't have fences in between, that have this great garden in the middle. There's all these corners that need tending, these community spaces. And often I think those communal spaces get tended by uh, kind of invisible leaders or spontaneous leadership that people just get motivated on a day to do something. And then maybe they come and they go, they leave. Um, some people are transient here um, and things you know fall off after they they don't get passed on so I'm really interested in living in a place like this how can we build a culture of living in this eco village that makes sure that we pass down information and practices and all the necessities to make this place run well and to support each other not just the physical spaces but the social spaces too um, we're experimenting a lot with um, our our community processes you know we have a a, a skeleton structure of having a monthly meeting, having a protocol for inviting new people here and making sure they're a good fit for the community. Uh, but there have been some things missing. You know, we've learned a lot from our elders, like we talked to Rob earlier. Um, but one thing that Hannah brought here was um, emotional cleansing and creation. We have a, a monthly work party as well called cleansing and creation, where we do some of the physical work around the place. And some of us noticed that we need a space like that for our emotional body, our emotional community body. Um, so that was something, do you wanna say more about why you started doing that? Uh, yeah, um, it kind of came up. Um, we were inviting, or there was someone who was invited to interview here, to live here, and it just became really apparent that um, this person wasn't gonna work out. And the fact that like they had even come for an interview just like kind of displayed all these problems that were happening. And um, it became really clear that like, just uh, the way that people feel here wasn't like being shared in a community space. And um, um, there's a need for, there was, there was like a lot that was like being felt, but like 
on set or on herd and um yeah so we're in this state there's a lot of people here right now who are really motivated to build systems like this and build you know come up with solutions but we're renters the reality is we have a landlord and we're renters and why would we do this work um what is what is the long-term benefit to us <laughs> and how is this like culturally sustainable and economically sustainable so this has led me to, to begin thinking about um collective ownership land ownership land trust um and we're really new to that process because currently the property is still held privately um, by Rob. And if there are other people who have experience of setting up land trusts, I invite you to be in touch. I'm doing a lot of research right now and collaborating locally with other folks who are trying to do this and set it up in a way that is um, not only benefiting the people who are currently here, but also that's um, equitable, that, that that addresses land reparations. You know, who are the people who have been forcibly removed from their lands, from this land? Who are the people who have immigrated here um, because they weren't able to stay where they live? Who are the people that have been, um, you know, system systematically excluded from land access? And how can we set up a land trust or some land holding entity that can account for those inequities and address them? Um, one example I have heard about recently on the East Coast is Soul Fire Farm that is meant for uh, people of marginalized backgrounds. Um, they don't name specifically by race in their bylaws because it's um, not allowed by housing discrimination laws. So they say people who have been oppressed and marginalized by the existing institutions. Um, and I really invite people to, to look at that as a model. And if you're looking at land to really factor in land reparations to the indigenous people of the place that you are and for people who have been excluded from land access in our country, um, that's something that's really important to us and we're, we're very slowly building relationships in our area to, to work towards that and to really examine how we can, how we can do this equitably. One project that um, one of our neighbors has started um, supporting is, is um, offering a network of support for asylum seekers from Central America who have been forced off of their land um, for unsafe living conditions. And so we're, we're offering rent subsidies um, and fundraising to support um, three folks from Central America and living, who are living in our community, which brings up a whole lot of questions about um, how do we do bilingual community process? <laughs> um, there's a lot that we're learning and a lot that we aren't doing well yet, but um, that we have to face. And this is, this is where the world is at right now. If, if there are people out there with land and with resources and who are doing fine, there are so many other people who aren't. And I just really encourage people to think about who within your reach can you share that with? Who can you inspire and support and listen to and uplift with whatever you're doing and whatever you know, whatever you want to learn? Just find people around you. One of my themes right now is um, getting out of the circle mentality. One thing that can happen in a place like an eco village is that we just all band together and hang out with each other because we like each other. We're like-minded people. We want to hang out and have bonfires and have a good time. But the circle is not the only structure that we need right now. And especially in these times that we're facing, we need to reach out. We need to expand this circle. We need to include our neighbors who don't think like us. We need to knock on people's doors and say, hey, who are you? You have to eat too. You're raising children too. You know, how can we, how can we support each other? And what are we willing to let go of so that we can build a broad network of support? Um, that's what I'm interested in right now. Um, haven't been taking a look at any of the chats. Are there questions or um, comments to address? Let's see. No, I think you're doing good. Cool. Um, so some of the permaculture principles, I think that what I'm speaking to draws on is integrating feedback and adapting to change. Those are really, uh, important things right now. Um, a lot of the systems that we've been using, um, specifically at Maitreya, and I think in the world in general, um, you know, there are things to, to hold on to and not just totally throw out with the bathwater, but there's a lot that we need to re-examine as well. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot more changes happening in our future. And a place like this that has a long history of organic gardening and of community building, we have so much um, we have a head start on the on you know a lot of other people in the world and 
yeah, I'm feeling really motivated right now to just get it together, get our systems organized, figure out how we can infuse modern reality and new ideas, support the young people, support the people new to this country uh, in just fueling the changes that need to occur to survive as a species and to take care of our lands and to take care of each other. Let's see. What do you have to add? Mm. About land sharing? Yeah. What was your experience like when you first got here? What did you notice? What inspired you? Um, for context, I, um, I'm 22. I've been here for about six months and I was invited here by a friend. Um, what inspired me to move here? Mm -hmm. um, so I recently graduated from um, college and I studied kind of like human geography and economics and um, um, basically like what I was learning in that was like, like all these systems are like falling apart and that I'd been raised to believe that whatever were useful, but like everything is colonialism and um, uh, basically the way that like Americans live isn't sustainable and so permaculture and like gardening was like very attractive I mean it was like a beautiful thing it was like a really cool social thing and um, um, yeah I just wanted to be in I'd heard of permaculture spaces and of like eco villages and co-ops and um, I've, I visited my friend here once and it seemed really cool um, and I was looking to move and then moving here um, the, the greatest thing that I've appreciated about this um, is the sense of safety um, I've like I feel really safe here in a way that like like before I was renting a house and I felt safe like I did feel safe um, I had friends who I cared about there but it's just like I felt disconnected from my neighbors and just like the structure of houses next to each other. Like, and, and this isn't to like, what I'm about to say now isn't to criminalize anyone or to cast any stereotypes, but like people would at night just like walk through a yard. Like my, my yard was, my window was on the first floor and I would like, like people would walk by and, or like sleep out. And there's like a huge houseless issue um, here in Eugene and, um, like um and also i was like on this really busy street where like there'd be car crashes and there'd be like sirens and like it's just like really kind of a lot going on and so like uh yeah it's just i feel safe here even though things do happen like people do um come in here like i literally had a guest here and like someone like came into their room like is creepy um so things do happen here but i have this sense of safety and like really appreciate having groups of people like living with groups of people and um that's been like something that's like really changed in terms of like um that's something i really appreciate about like living is being with people yeah and and living in close quarters can bring up a lot of conflict and takes a lot of work but like Hannah said, it brings a lot of benefits too. And one thing that's really important is the intergenerationality of community. You know, oftentimes communities are just kind of one generation that, that sticks together. But I think it's really important right now that we look to our elders for wisdom, that we look to our young people for inspiration and to identify what needs we need to have. Um, one of the things that's inspiring around here is with the, the closure of schools or with the just dramatic change in public school systems. Um, a lot of parents are opting out and needing to find different educational systems for their kids. So um, we're slowly growing alternatives. You know, some people have already been doing homeschooling, but that doesn't necessarily work for everyone. So how do we actually, as people with skills, with interest in land tending, how do we offer these skills to, to our young people and invite them into our systems and adapt our systems to include the young people and how do we draw on the elders for their wisdom and their experience um, to feed into that. I think that's really important right now. Um, 
Another thing being in an urban environment, um, we do have a lot of folks, you know, coming in and out and uh, we're right on the, the can corridor, people who are collecting cans and dropping them off at the local um, can distribution site, that's their job. Um, you know, we'll offer them food when we can, we'll offer to, uh, you know, just talk. A lot of people just need to be listened to right now. There's a lot of people struggling. Um, so trying to think outside of the bubble of permaculture, outside the bubble of our eco village and see where are we, where are we in our context of society? What are the things that we have that we can generously the offer? The intersection. Yeah. You know, I think we have a lot of work to do too. Like, is there more we can do to offer affordable housing for people or offer a street space for cars? Um, that kind of happens organically where we are anyways, but are there ways we can um, just branch out our circle more, expand that spiral outward, um, share our abundance. Permaculture is all about cultivating abundance and um, you know who do we give that to who around you can you offer that to um, I think that was a really important time I also wanted to add on the land access front um, land reparation soul fire farm is one thing that I that I offered that I've been really inspired by lately another thing um, is uh, cultural respect easements if if you are living in a place that has a lot of land or that has um, just large expanses of kind of native landscape um there's a kind of less a less intense way from a culture from a like a conservation easement is just to have a simple written agreement that offers land access to um, indigenous community members or tribes and that's um something that you have to navigate delicately but that's something that we're exploring in our area too is just how do we you know give this land back or offer land access find out what people want from this land um, yeah, we have a long ways to go on that front too. Okay, looking at some comments, uh, seeing questions. I, I have a question. I yeah. haven't seen any questions more so as comments. Okay. I was wondering about your format for community meetings and your work parties. Like I remember when we had that camp out, we had like an open format where everyone kind of got to come with whatever they had at that time. Do you use that kind of structure or do you have a like a round table or is there a set time for a work party every month and you're meeting every month or do you kind of peg it and hope people can come? Is there consequences if people don't? How does that sort of I call it a organizational theory <laughs> of people being a part of these things. How, how does that manifest for you there? Um, so we have a structure, we have a, um, we have a handbook that has some policies in it that we share with whoever's arriving here that kind of gets us on the same page about how to use the space, some general protocols to keep everyone um, included and happy. We have a, a once a month, meeting that's um, two hours and it's rotating facilitation that's voluntary. Um, we're uh, kind of like I mentioned earlier with the, the turnover of people, um, it, it kind of depends on culture to pass those things on because I've found that what's written in the, po in the policies handbook doesn't really work unless it's being reinforced by culture. Um, so often things get forgotten and don't get passed on. So we're, we're Currently, we went through a big turnover recently, and we're going through a process of re-examining our policies and digging them up and finding out what they even are and um, finding out if they work. So um, we do have some systems in place that are, that are pretty, pretty standing with the you know, once a month meeting, voluntary facilitation, once a month work party. We ask people to contribute three hours a month to um, the collective spaces. Um, it happens kind of in, in spontaneous um, fashion. So for example, this Saturday, a couple of us got motivated to clean the, the main community building and we just sent out an email. We have an email listserv that everyone's on and that's how we communicate with each other primarily in between meeting times. And so anyone can post to that and say, hey, I wanna do this project, uh, I'd like some help. And um, people can show up and, and offer what they can. A lot of times our work parties are in the garden where we're clearing vegetation, um, pruning the trees, collecting, collecting apples, collecting pears. Um, we also are a community that really values fun and festivals. So we have a lot of um, traditions that we kind of spontaneously uphold. There's like 
usually an apple pressing party in the fall. Um, we celebrate May Day in the spring. Um, we have someone here who brews beer and puts it in a kegerator for anyone to, to offer donations to. And um, he grows hops. So then there's a hop picking party and processing. Um, so we have a lot of, like I said earlier, spontaneous leadership where it's just people doing their passion projects, doing what fills them up, offering what they love to give to the world, and then inviting other people to participate in that. And I think that is really what runs this place, um, is those, those informal, spontaneously, you know, just passion projects that bring people in and bring people together. And we have the physical space that supports that. That's really, those are like the really key pieces, like people with passions, inviting others, and the space that supports that. You know, where we have places that we encounter our neighbors, that we meet them, um, this kind of shared understanding that it's okay to greet your neighbors, which not everybody has in the places that they live. And I think that makes, makes us really lucky that we have that, um, that shared agreement that we'll do that. Um, also means we have to have good boundaries, like, hey, I don't have time to talk right now, like, let's talk later. Um, yeah. Okay, I see a question. Yeah, we, uh, we had a question about how many people were there. And if no one's not looking at the chat, there's 30 to 35 people. Uh, and then it was asked how long you've been there. I would add to that, how long has the community been there and how many buildings and spatially, how much land does the community occupy? Yeah, so, so like you learned earlier, um, there's a landlord who owns the property right now and we're working on how we can, what the succession plan is for that, that will last beyond this person's lifespan. Um, and altogether, I believe it's like two acres, maybe three. Um, I've lived here, I lived here for three years uh, and then I took a, a three year break to live at a different land trust called Apravecho. And then I came back um, about a year and a half ago, and I've been here since, and I intend to stay a while longer. Um, and what I love about this community right now is it's, um, the lines are getting really fuzzy on where community starts and ends, because we've kind of adopted our neighbors, we've invited them to use our community buildings. Um, one system I didn't mention is there's a $25 per month per person fee that runs all the community spaces. Um, and at some point we realized, well, why couldn't we just invite our neighbors to use those spaces too? Um, and so we did. And now, you know, on the, the lots owned by, that, that, by Rob, there's maybe 30 people. But if we include the neighbors who we've given access to the community buildings for, it's probably up to 40. Um, and we're trying to expand even further. You know, we go around to our neighbors when we can and we offer food, we offer, we invite them to our events. Um, and I think that's a really important and dynamic part of Maitreya is just that permeability. You know, how do we include more people in this community and intentionally make those lines blurry? This is kind of like a hub of a wheel and it doesn't stop here. Nice, Shaylee, thank you for taking notes. Can I ask oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just curious how you guys handle conflict. Because you mentioned some of that, but I didn't know if that was in your bylaws or things that you, yeah. Do you want to talk about the good vibes committee? Um, sure. Um, yeah, there's a, there's like, what's there, I guess there are guilds here. Um, and like one of the guilds is like about membership, some people have volunteered to like listen to uh, or call references for potential uh, incoming members um, and another guild is Good Vibes and Good Vibes uh, basically is like a conflict resolution group so it's a couple people who agreed to like meet with some people here who might have a conflict and just kind of like hear their sides and just act as like mediators as far as I'm aware I'd yeah. Uh, so you basically have two guilds, the good vibe ones. What did you call the other one? Was that the creative committee? Membership review. Committee. Membership review committee. And is that like path to being there 
a part of the handbook too? And the membership kit MIDI reviews it? Because we're all currently renting, all of these roles are voluntary and um, can't technically be legally enforced, you know? It's, this is all culture we're talking about here, that this isn't le rigid legal structure. And that's the dance we're doing now is figuring out what of this can we codify and incentivize people, you know, towards uh, a rent to own model or, or land trust participation. Um, but for now, people do it because they want to, because they want to participate with each other. They want to be part of something beyond themselves. Some of the other guilds that we have, um, Hannah mentioned membership and good vibes. We have a firewood guild that helps people collect firewood. I'm on that one. Um, a landscape guild. Um, we have, what else other guilds do we have? We have other ones. Gardening guild. There's, um, some of the gardens are, are shared and uh, the landscape guild helps coordinate around the perennials and the fruit tree harvesting and, and pruning. And then there's individual plots that we kind of at the beginning of the gardening season, we uh, kind of lay out the map and survey everyone like, okay, how much garden space do you want? And we make sure everybody has, a, has enough space um, to garden. And so far that's worked out very well of just, you know, getting together and saying, what does everyone need? Often if people have been here for a while, um, they're continuing to take care of the same plots or they'll pass it on to someone if they leave. Um, one thing that I noticed was missing when I came back here a year and a half ago was that a lot of the shared buildings don't really have a clear way that they are maintained. So we're introducing some new systems that uh, kind of just fill the gaps on, on cleanliness. And um, I'm starting to introduce a domain system where we just post a sign saying, here's the space, here are the needs for the space, and then assigning voluntarily names to take to, to bottom line taking care of that space whether that means they do it themselves or they say hey it's time to do a deep clean of the of the of the sanctuary space um, we're gonna have a work party so just to empower people because uh, one thing I'm noticing with the kind of uh, flat model of, of collective management is uh, often things will either fall through the gaps or um, will fall on the same people over and over who um, who like to give or who are habituated to, to give more than others. And um, that doesn't turn out to be very equitable. So trying to just um, empower people to envision spaces and take care of them um, and assign some accountability so that there's just, you know, if something needs tending to, there's a name posted in the space that other people know they can um, say, hey, I noticed there's a lot of clutter in the space. Could we have a work party soon? And they can make an announcement to do that. Um, so just having some more clarity on how things happen. And I think that helps too when there's new people that arrive here. I notice a lot of enthusiasm when people arrive to a new community. They want to know how things work. They want to know how they can contribute. And it's really helpful when that's um, laid out in a, in a clear way that they can understand and they can see, you know, as they get to know the space, in what ways they can participate. Um, so, so I'm trying to build some more clarity around those systems. Becca, did you have a question? No, okay. Um, looks like we got about seven more minutes. Does anyone have other um, questions? It's gotten dark. <laughs> right. Becca, yeah, I was there. there, there, I'm oh. sorry. I faded out there. I'm over in Rishikesh, so uh, the connection's not real good okay, sometimes. <laughs> so I, I live, um, eight months at Common Ground uh, Echo Community in Beaverton for eight months. And I've also read who um, owned and operated a health spa in Southern California. And uh, over and over again, the things that were most troublesome were around communication. That is always <laughs> where the big flare-ups came from of issues that uh, weren't being addressed soon enough or by the time they did, it, it wasn't in a compassionate manner because people were uh, too flustered. One resource that's available to everybody is um, 
Tom Bond's online year-long program in compassionate communication, which which the, he has a sliding scale basically. So if people don't have money, you you can still attend. And there's also a facilitator tract accompanied with that. So so twice a week, I'm involved in either weekly um, discourses or meetings or practice groups. And it's, it's a wonderful way to uh, build resiliency in a community, um, having compassionate communication. And it's, it's really uh, a lot of training, a lot of uh, growing that has to happen along those lines. It, it doesn't just happen with a willingness for it. It's, it's the skill that's developed. So um, it starts every September. So it's, but next September, it will open up again for um, for the program but but there's practice groups people can join in online um that could help build those skills so um i i hope you um might want to avail yourselves of that it it would save a lot of grief for people um a couple of the things i liked about common ground um, were the meals we had. Uh, you could sign up f for meals three times a week with the community and you could either cook or and lead that or you could assist or you could do cleanup and there's a point system attached to that. Um, but that was, that was really fun. Um, the work parties were once a month, it was a four hours each. And then once a month, there was a group meeting to prioritize issues and, and address anything that was coming up there. And, and there was an inside group and there's an outside group. So that inside group dealt with keeping the community house working well and clean. So that's my All input. Right. Hope it helps. Thanks for sharing some other examples of uh, collective spaces and sharing space. It's really valuable. Maybe one more question or sharing. There was a question in chat, I think, about do you guys grow your own food and how that works out for you guys? Yeah. We actually don't do our, our primary. Uh, like I said earlier, our primary kind of unit of household is smaller than the entire community. Uh, household sizes range from uh, two to six. And every household kind of determines for themselves how much food sharing they want to do, how much they want to, how intensively they want to garden in the plots that they um, take on. There's perennials that everyone has access to. Um, that's pretty supplemental. Um, because of our urban location, we have a lot of easy access to urban food. And some folks who have been here a while have done a really good job of um, making best use of food that otherwise would get wasted. So um, uh, food pantry, uh, things that don't get taken by other community members, we end up with large boxes of produce that um, is in fine condition for eating but hasn't hasn't made it to plates yet. Um, so we have a, a free food shelf that's also a space that people can share their um, gardening abundance that they have in excess. Um, so we're pretty independent in how we manage our food systems, but we do a lot of sharing. And people will also often say, hey, I made a big pot of soup, come on over, or let's have a potluck, um, or I know of this place that people can get free food boxes, you know, especially like during this pandemic, a lot of people were struggling, um, not having jobs or, or having their usual rhythms interrupted. So a lot of sharing of resources in, in an informal way and um, connecting people with how to get resources. Um, we're, cons all things considered, I'll say that this, given the state of the world, the intensity of gardening has increased 
quite a bit and a lot more interest in food security and working out how to do that. We haven't yet tested our ability to actually sustain ourselves on this lot. I don't know if that's possible. We would definitely have to get some animals, which I don't know if it's up to city code. We've had some chickens, but um, not on any significant scale to really be able to meet all of our food needs here. Um, and that's not necessarily a goal of ours. You know, we live in an urban area. We have connections across the city. We aren't, we aren't trying to be an isolated bubble. We want to be connected with other community groups. We want to figure out how to share what we have and accept what other people have. Um, that's, that's really part of, part of the point of being here. Cool. And I think thank we're at you. time now. So thank you very much for uh, the opportunity. And I look forward to hearing from everybody else this weekend. Cool, thank you so much for hopping in and sharing. Um, as we transition to the next session, we can take a bit of a break if anyone needs to hop off from their screen. And I wanna give 